Normally, I would ask you to stand while I read the scripture, but I found a uh, movie version that hopefully will work better than me. Let's uh, listen to John 17. Father, the hour has come. Give glory to your son so that the Son may give glory to you. For you gave him authority over all people, so that he might give eternal life to all those you gave him. And eternal life means to know you, the only true God, and to know Jesus Christ, whom you sent. I have shown your glory on earth. I have finished the work you gave me to do. Father, give me glory in your presence now the same glory I had with you before the world was made. I have made you known to those you gave me out of the world. They belong to you, and you gave them to me. They have obeyed your word, and now they know that everything you gave me comes from you. I gave them the message that you gave me, and they received it. They know that it is true that I came from you, and they believe that you sent me. I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those you gave me, for they belong to you. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine, and my glory is shown through them, and now I am coming to you. I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. Holy Father, keep them safe by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one, just as you and I are one. While I was with them, I kept them safe by the power of your name, the name you gave me. I protected them, and not one of them was lost, except the man who was bound to be lost, so that the scripture might come true. And now I am coming to you and I say these things in the world so that they may have my joy in their hearts in all its fullness. I gave them your message and the world hated them because they do not belong to the world just as I do not belong to the world. But I do not ask you to take them out of the world. But I do ask you to keep them safe from the evil one. Just as I do not belong to the world, they do not belong to the world. Dedicate them to yourself by means of the truth. Your word is truth. I sent them into the world just as you sent me into the world. And for their sake, I dedicate myself to you in order that they too may be truly dedicated to you. I pray not only for them, but also for those who believe in me because of their message. I pray that they may all be one. Father, May they be in us, just as you were in me and I am in you. May they be one so that the world will believe that you sent me. I gave them the same glory you gave me, so that they may be one just as you and I are one. I in them and you in me. So that they may be completely one, in order that the world may know that you sent me, and that you love them as you love me. Father, you have given them to me, and I want them to be with me where I am, so that they may see my glory, the glory you gave me, for you loved me before the world was made. Righteous Father, the world does not know you, but I know you, and these know that you sent me. I made you known to them, and I will continue to do so in order that the love you have for me may be in them, and so that I also may be in them. So we're looking at the subject of prayer here in John 17. This is Jesus praying right before he goes into the Garden of Gethsemane with his disciples. Now, um, prayer is a really important subject, 
and it's something that impacts every believer and every person who may not claim to be a believer but gets in trouble because most of us have prayed when difficult times come. Even if it's just, oh God, uh, I, I believe he hears it. So uh, a pastor's wife sent me a, a kid's prayer and uh, she said, when I gave birth to my youngest, a boy, my daughter, age six, whined, but I prayed for a girl, for a sister. Her brother, age four, replied, but I prayed harder <laughs> to get a little brother, I guess. A couple of the kids' prayers. Dear God, did you mean for giraffes to look like that, or was it an accident? That's Norma, age seven. Uh, Frank, age nine. Dear God, I'm doing the best I can, really. And everyone said, amen. Bobby, age eight. Dear God, it must be super hard to love all the people in the world, especially my brother. I don't know how you do it. <laughs> Peter, age seven. Dear God, please send Dennis Clark to a different summer camp this year. <laughs> uh, yeah. So Jesus is praying a really broad and deep prayer here. In fact, he's praying about things that haven't happened yet. 2,000 years ago, He's praying in advance of our time right now. And he goes all the way back to when the world was made. So uh, understanding, Scripture says that we have two kinds of vision. One of is, is physical light, you know, hits the lenses, goes through into the back of our eye to the retina, and uh, it fires off rods and cones, which goes to something called the occipital lobe and all the way to the back of your head. And, and it's compared with an index of things that you've seen since you were a little kid to make a recognition so that we'll be able to grasp what it is, the image we're looking at. But scripture talks about spiritual vision as a separate thing. Um, and it's something that requires us to look at near things, things that are close to us, and things that are far. Now, when I was studying years ago, uh, every day in science, I started having trouble with my eyes, and I went to an eye surgeon, and he said, you're, you're hammering your eyes. You can't look at a page close to you uh, that long. You have to look off. And uh, I started looking into what he was saying, and he's right, we have these orbs, these, these eyeballs, if you will. And when you look at a page, that's not natural. The back of your eye is actually pulled by your muscles into a cone shape so you can get the focal length that's called longer. But if you'll stop and just look off like out that window, don't look now, uh, I'm teasing. Uh, the, at the furthest thing you can look at, then the eye relaxes and it goes back to its natural shape. So that's the way you can study long hours. You just have to take a break every 15 minutes or so and, and look away. But that's exactly the way it works in spiritual vision too. If you only look at the things that are in front of you today or tomorrow or yesterday, it, it becomes all about your little world. But that's not what God has called us to. He's called us to change the entire world. He's called us to serve him all over the world. And he interjects that into this prayer. My favorite scientist was Sir Isaac Newton. Uh, he, he's estimated to have one of the highest 100 IQs in the whole world, like more than 200. Normal IQs are around 100 or 110 if you're really bright. This was at 200, and he was an expert in optics, making lenses, telescopes, and chemistry and mechanical things, but uh, he was also a very dedicated believer. He had a personal relationship with God. I read an atheist that said, well, everybody went to church in those days. No, no, you idiot. He writes about Jesus. I'm sorry, did I say idiot? He writes about his own personal relationship with Jesus. This is what he said. He said, uh, I, I take my telescope and I can look millions of years out into the future. But 
when I lay it aside and I go into my room and shut the door and get down on my knees in earnest prayer, I see more of heaven and feel closer to God than if I were assisted by all the telescopes on earth. So great prayers are prayers that come from the heart, you to God. Now, the Bible's got some great prayers in it. Abraham, in uh, Genesis 18, prays and looks down the hallways, the annals of time. Moses, in uh, Exodus 32, he has a great prayer, and he prays for the people of God all the way up to our time. Uh, Solomon's prayer in 1 Kings chapter 8 is an amazing one about the temple and God's coming. But none of those compare to the breadth the length of time or the depth of this prayer that we're looking at, the one of Jesus. It's the longest prayer in, in the scope of time in the entire Bible. Now, the Apostle John was there. He heard this prayer. And if you've been with us, you remember that this section is a long sermon, uh, a message that Jesus is giving to his disciples. It started back in chapter 13. And they were at the Last Supper, it's called, right in the upper room. And uh, he's giving them lessons, and so he gives them an object lesson. He gets down on his knees and he washes their feet to teach them about servanthood. He was teaching you, he was teaching me about it too, about serving each other. And then he moves on at the end of chapter 14, he says, and let's go now. And they walk across, they head east across the city of Jerusalem at night. It's probably a half mile, not real far, but it's dark. This is Passover, so there's no moon. It's always on a new moon. And as they're walking along, he's teaching them, and he goes past the Herod's temple, it was called in those days, and the front of it, the door of it, had a vine on it, you'll remember we talked about. And that vine was to represent Israel. It still is the national symbol of the nation of Israel. And he stops there, no doubt, and points to it and says, I am the vine, and you're the branches. If you stay, abide, stay connected with me, then your life will bring forth fruit, that what you do in life will be significant, and you'll have a life that is fulfilling to you if you stay connected to him. And he goes a little further. They get to the eastern gate, and they look down on the, uh, the Kidron Valley, the little valley, the little stream that runs through, and, and they're going up to the Mount of Olives for the Gethsemane, right? And so it's here where he stops, and he's overlooking the Garden of Gethsemane. He knows he's going to die in a matter of a very short time, that night. And he is telling his disciples their final instructions before they go out into the world. Now, this section is so important, just the chapter that we're in right now, 17. We looked at the first half last week. This week we'll try and get down to the end of it, 26, if I just go a little faster. Uh, the, uh, the reformer, John Knox, I mentioned him. He said it was his, the most important part of Scripture where he laid his anchor, where he first got attached to Christ. And, and at the end of his life, on his deathbed, he asked his wife to read it to him. And when she finished, she said, again. And she did it more than three times right before he passed. He wanted to be thinking these thoughts when he got to heaven. And so uh, it is, chapter 17, a very important section of Scripture. Now, there's three parts to it. Verse 12 through 23, he talks about unity. Now, there's a difference between the word unity and uniformity. He's talking about believers, all the believers in the world need to have unity, but not uniformity. Uniformity means that we all dress the same way, we all are cookie cutter Christians. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about on the essentials, the things that are really important, we agree with believers all over the world. And you can go smuggle Bibles into China and they'll appreciate you because they understand that you understand the importance of God's word or the Ukraine, or 
Vietnam, where Dennis is going next week. So you and I have this opportunity to touch the world by just taking the Bible, the Word of God, to others. And that unity that comes from that is the way the world knows that we are his disciples. So that's where we're going, these three parts, unity, heaven, and love. And so let's jump in and see what God might say to us. He's praying for his disciples, verse 12, and that includes you and me. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. And we talked about last week, in the first century, the name was significant. Your name, any person's name was significant. Parents waited to give a name to their child until the child showed some characteristic. And you'll remember that uh, Jacob, Jacob uh, was a heel catcher. And that name caught on him, became his, because he held on to his brother's foot. He saw him, tried to hold him back so he could come out first and get the birthright. So every person's name in the first century in the Jewish culture had a significance attached to their personality, who they are, their focus in life. So he said, I kept them in your name, Father God, who you are, kept them close, those whom I gave you, I have kept. And none of them is lost, except the son of lostness. There's a play on words here in the, in the Greek, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Of course, he's talking about Judas. But don't misunderstand his statement here about it being fulfilled. Somebody had to betray Jesus. It did not have to be Judas. If you saw the old rock musical, Jesus Christ superstar the theology was a disaster the music wasn't all that good either but uh, the, the the guy that wrote it the screenwriter said judas felt trapped i can't do anything like besides this because i was predestined to do it no that's not what scripture says if it hadn't been him it would have been someone else the scripture said somebody was going to betray him but it didn't have to be judas god is fair he is just and so he's talking about somebody that made their own decision. It's from Psalm 41, verse 9. Verse 13. Now I come to you, talking to Father God, and these things I speak in the world, speak out loud. He wants his disciples to hear this. Them and the eleven and you and I. That they may have my joy fulfilled in them. Jesus had joy we're told even the joy of the cross because he saw you and I. Joy is not happiness. It's not about that moment of joy, or I, I, wrong term, uh, that happiness of, of excitement. Joy is the quiet, straight line. It's like an orchestra playing a cello line, just one note that all the rest of it coordinates with, harmonizes with. Joy is possible in your life and mine by a choice. I choose joy. I got up this morning, you don't care about me, but grumping, and, uh, and I have this dog that listens to everything. You know, a bulldog, which means he doesn't say anything at all. He just snores at night, yeah. And so I have, his name is Winston. So I talked to Winston this morning, and then I prayed. Yes, I know, I went to the dog first. I'm just being transparent. And I prayed for joy, and God said, choose it. Oh, yeah, I remember, Lord. It's my choice. I can choose to be joyful today, or I can be grumpy. So I chose joy. Where does your joy come from? He says it comes from God. My joy fulfilled in them. You are the them he's praying for. You are a disciple of Jesus Christ. I bet 2,000 years later, but you are. Verse 14, I have given them your word. And the Greek word for word here is logos. Logic, we would say, but that's not what they meant. We're studying God's word, his written word. 
And Jesus is saying, I've given them your word so they can write it down later. John was the eyewitness that we're reading what Jesus said because the Holy Spirit enlightened John to remember decades later, word for word, what Jesus said. So I've given them your logos and the world has hated them because they're not of the world. They are not citizens of the world any longer. Just as I am not of the world. He's going to describe that a little bit further. So here's what happens when you're born again. You lose your citizenship in whatever country you're from. Your passport, it may say the United States of America on it, it might say Mexico, it might say Canada, it might say some other place in the world. But if you're born again, you're a citizen of heaven now. You belong to a monarchy and the, the king is Jesus. And you have a citizenship outside of this country. That's not to say that we don't have responsibilities as living here as citizens in America. But you are not of this world system. We talked about that last week. When he uses the word world, you have to look at the context, whether he's talking about the earth or is he talking about Babylon, the world system that is going to fall someday. That reference may not make sense to you until we get to the book of Revelation. It's very clear in Revelation. There is a world system that has been going on all the way back into the earliest chapters of Genesis, and it's called Babylon. And it has been opposed to the city of God, Jerusalem. And this book we're studying is the story of two cities, kind of like Charles Dickens, the tale of two cities. He was talking about London and Paris, but Jesus is talking about Babylon, the world system, and heaven's system, Jerusalem. And you're a citizen now of that city. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world. Oh, rats, we're going to have to stay. Because he's praying for you and I. When somebody gets saved, under my system, if I was king... When somebody gets saved, I, I just jettison you into eternity, into heaven. But that's not the way God planned it. He keeps us here so that we can be a witness. So the people can see our lives and say, that's a Christian? They're a mess. There might be hope for me. Maybe I could believe in God too. See, that's our purpose here to look like the flawed vessels we really are, not to claim to be Pharisees. Oh, I have it together. Let's pray now when you start praying in King James English. Nobody's impressed with that. Maybe in the 1600s they were, but they shouldn't have been. So you and I are called out of this world because Jesus is not of this world. And they, and, and he said, and keep them from the, keep the evil one from them. So he's not taking us away from the world. He's not taking me or you out of our problems, those difficulties you're in right now that you're worried about next week and the following month. He's not going to take us out of them, but he will show us how to go through them and then bless us in the middle of them and we get closer to him. 16. They are not of the world just as I'm not of the world. Philippians 3.20 says we're no longer citizens of earth. We are citizens of heaven. 17, sanctify them. Now, that sounds like a very religious word. It means to set something apart. To place someone, you in this case, set them apart by your truth. That's why we study the Bible. That's the truth. The, the Bible doesn't contain some truth. Jesus said he was the truth. Sanctify them. Set them aside by your truth. That's what's happening to you and to me right now. I'm reading that you're listening to it. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. We've talked about that before. As you, your word is true. As you sent me, verse 18, into the world, I also have sent them into the world. This is earth, okay? But it also is Babylon. That you and I are, are called to go into the world. Now, this is a very important statement about missions and missionary. Jesus does not say that you should stay in your own 
area and serve him there only. Listen carefully. I, I work with young pastors, speak at pastors' conferences, and, and the, the buzzword with young pastors today is missional living, which is code for you don't have to leave Redlands. You just hang here and you help people. You take care of social needs of people. We don't have the luxury to stay here. Jesus said in Mark 16, 50, go into all the world and preach the gospel and, and serve God other places in the world. Well, pastor, I don't feel safe outside of California. Really? You live next to San Bernardino <laughs> and you think it's not safe in the world? Go down D Street after midnight sometime. That happens when we go to Israel. I love it. Every once in a while, you meet some new Israeli guy. He said, where are you from? I said, uh, L.A. He said, oh, my goodness, that's a scary place to live. A guy living in Israel where they're shooting rockets over his head every night. So we live in a scary part of the world. So the rest of the world shouldn't be wor worrisome to you. That's what God is calling us to do. I sent them into the world. Well, I don't know how to go to the world, Look, Pastor. We have two groups to go to Mexico every week, or every month, excuse me, every other week. We've got one group of men and women that are right now going down to just outside of Rosarita Beach. It's tough to go to the beach in Mexico. They're, they're serving Jesus at the beach. We've got a beach house somebody owns up here, and we use it. But they're over at Casa, the house of Esperanza, which is a battered woman's home where they have children and women who have been so handled. And they bring uh, Sunday school stuff for the kids. They introduce them to Jesus. And they're looking for volunteers. There's a table outside waiting for them. The other group is a, a group of mostly guys, but my daughters have been gals too. And they load up their pickup trucks in their vans and they take food and medicine to more than 40 orphanages around Tucati and Ensenada. Orphanages that are filled with kids that are handicapped and mentally disabled. They bring pampers and, and dry formula and, and food that the government doesn't take care of them. And so people from this church, we've been part of the Mexican Children Aid for 40 years, as long as I've been around here. Go into all the world, he said. I've sent you into the world, Jesus says. You cannot give God. You go and do that, you will come home with a smile on your face for five days straight. It will bless your life. So, I have... A gazillion missionary stories, I'll save one till the end. Verse 19. And for their sakes, verse 19, for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they may also be sanctified by the truth. Uh, the Greek word sanctify, hagaizo, means to be set apart, as I said, consecrated, dedicated. Jesus said, I've dedicated myself to my disciples. That's you. That's me. He went back to heaven, and he intercedes for us. He prays to the Father for us. And I mean personally, George, for you. Jesus prays to the Father for you. Let's see how many people I can embarrass. No, I, I won't go any further. But you get the idea. Willie, Jesus is praying for you. To the Father, so that your life might be blessed, and you might be a blessing to others as you go into the world. So, the disciples believed this, and they did it. I mean, you go through the stories, um, there are, uh, the gospel spread from Jerusalem, this group, 11 guys, and they go out into the world. And they go to Turkey, then Asia Minor, and they, like, John gets all the way, um, James, excuse me, gets all the way to India, where he loses his life. Every one of the disciples were killed on the mission field. That isn't, what a great presentation, Pastor. I'm sure that'll make people want to volunteer out at that table you were talking about. 
You know, Paul is beheaded in Rome, Peter crucified upside down there, on and on. But the gospel went from Jerusalem, especially by the Apostle Paul, to Antioch, where all the Turkish um, and Syrian earthquakes were just a couple of weeks ago. That's right up next to Antioch, where Paul himself went with Barnabas. And from there, they leapfrogged across Turkey. And after they had done such a good job there, they looked across the the strait there and and said, let's go over there, Troas. And they go to Greece. And from Greece, the gospel began to spread north to Macedonia and and up up into Gaul, the Roman Empire at that time. And, And they went all the way to England. In the third century, the gospel was there. You can go to England today. The place where, anyway, but I digress. They, they touched the whole world. You and I are a product of these 11 guys. They took it seriously. And most of them gave their lives. John, he was 96 years old, according to one early church historian, before he finally passed. He lived in Ephesus. And he continued to serve the Lord up until his 96th birthday. Verse 20. I do not pray for those alone, but also for those who believe in me through them. Who's he talking about? If you're with somebody, turn to them and say, that's who he prayed for. He prayed for you. This is talking about you. That you would believe through their words, through the the Gospels, through the letters of the Apostle Paul, through the book of James, on and on. So, 21, that they all may be one. Ah, here's this unity issue. Uh, It's a key word for this section. That they may be one as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us, you and I, in the Trinity. That the world may believe that you sent me based upon their unity. Now, you might say, that's not working very good, Pastor. You know, churches are kind of notorious for infighting. I agree, they are. If you want to start a fight with a Christian, just ask them about worship style. You know, that'll, you know, there's, a, oh, well, you got to have organs. You got to have choirs. For some people, that's the only kind of worship you can have in church. For other people, it has to be acoustic guitars. You know, kind of like a, folk rock thing from the 60s or 70s. Okay. Somebody the other day, meaning to insult me, said, oh, you're from that rock and roll church. I took it as a compliment. (laughs) But that's a, a ground to have a fight with other Christians and disagree. Things that are not essential. You know, like cosmetics and women. I love the old J. Vernon McGee line. Someone called and said, you know, is it okay for a woman to wear cosmetics? And he said, if the barn needs painting, paint it. (laughs) That'll get me in trouble. (laughs) But areas that different denominations struggle back and forth with. You know, and uh, again, there are some things that are not negotiable. Uh, this is the Bible. This is God's word. It's in there. Jesus came from him. He is the son of God. He died on the cross. He rose from the dead. Those are not issues we can argue about. If you want to have fellowship with somebody, you've got to go with those. But there's a couple in the church that I was in their home the other night, and I saw this on the wall in our kitchen. It said, to dwell above with saints we love, that will be grace and glory. To live below with saints we know, now that's another story. And and this unity that Jesus is talking about is based upon love. But Christians see all these things that, did you know that there's more than 12,000 denominations in the United States alone? It, It goes on and on. And most of them came out of some split, some church fight over something. Now, years ago, I I discovered something about people. 
from a, a psychology professor up, professor up at the U of R. Okay, so he's a clinical psychologist, which means he had a practice where he talked to people every day kind of a thing. But he was lecturing in this class, and he said that he had just come back from a prison here in California. A prison for those who are mentally criminals, which is code for they probably killed somebody. And so they're in that prison for the rest of their lives. They are insane, okay? And uh, so he visited this prison and he met with some clients that he had there. And, uh, and so he told the class this story. He said, well, at lunchtime I went outside and they had this beautiful lawn and tree area. It was about an acre. And there were more than 150 prisoners out there. Read wackos, okay? And, and uh, he said, they're all over the place, you know, sitting on the ground and eating lunch and everything. And there's one single guard. And he walked up to the guard. He said, uh, aren't you afraid? And the guard said, no, afraid of what? He said that all these people would unite and take you down and escape over the wall. He said, that won't happen. The psychologist says to him, why? Well, what do you mean it won't happen? He said, well, paranoid psychotics never unite. If you're a born-again Christian and you're struggling with other born-again Christians, you might be a paranoid <laughs> psychotic. Maybe they're not messed up. It might be you. He was teaching a class these great truths, right? And I think he is right about when it comes to that. Okay, so in that class, I met a guy, and he's hilarious, okay? And, and I'm going to steal what he, he was talking to me about, denominations. And uh, this is his story. Now, he's talking about Baptists. He could be talking about Lutherans or Methodists or Catholics or any denomination. So I don't want to insult any Baptists that are here. That's just what he happened to be, okay? So he said, once I was in San Francisco, and I had a chance to walk across the Golden Gate Bridge. Walking along, I saw a guy up on the edge of the bridge getting ready to jump. And I thought, I'll try installing. I'll detain him long enough for me to put film in my camera. So I said, don't jump. And he turned his head and he said, you've heard of the elephant man? Well, this guy had a head like the head of a horse. My heart went out to him. I said, why the long face? He said, all my life people have called me mean names like cruel names, sea biscuit, chess piece, and trigger. Nobody loves me. I said, well, of course, God loves you. He said, how do you know that there's a God? And he said, well, of course there's a God. Do you think that billions of years ago, a bunch of molecules, molecules floating around at random without rhyme or reason would someday have the sense of humor to make you look like that? He said, well, I guess you're right. And there was a tear in his eyes. And I said, are you a Christian or a Jew or a Hindu or, or whatever? He said, I'm a Christian. And I said, small world, me too. Protestant or Catholic? He said, Protestant. I said, me too. What franchise? He said, Baptist. I said, me too. Northern Baptist or Southern Baptist? He said, Northern Baptist. I said, me too. Northern Conservative Baptist or Northern, Northern Liberal Baptist? And he said, well, Northern Conservative Baptist. Me too, I said. Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist or Northern Conservative Reformed Baptist? He said, well, Northern Conservative Fundamental Baptist. I said, well, me too. Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist Great Lakes Region or Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist Eastern Region? He said, Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist Great Lakes Region. I said, die, heretic, and I pushed him off the bridge. <laughs> Paul writes to the Ephesians, and he says, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. 
That's what we're called to do. So there are some things that are not negotiable, but when you find out the other person is a believer, don't focus too much on the style of worship or whether they wear makeup or whether they wear pants, and on and on the list goes. God's not concerned, and he doesn't want us to be either. Verse 22, and the glory which you gave me, this is the word that means majesty, the weight, you remember? In the Greek language, is doxa, the worth of somebody. In the Old Testament, it's kabod, it's the weight of something. He said, the weight, the display of his majesty, which you gave me, I have given to them, that they may be one just as we are one. Jesus had already given power to his disciples and he displayed his power through miracles. Now, you remember, he, he was God and he was compressed down into a little baby, six, seven, eight pounds. But every once in a while, the glory would pop out. You remember on the Mount of Transfiguration, the, the, the three disciples are there and all of a sudden Jesus turns into blazing light. Peter said, God dwells in unapproachable light. The majesty of Jesus popped out. And a couple other times, too. That's what he's talking about. But he's given that glory to you. That weight. How so, Pastor? You pray for somebody, and God just might choose to heal them at that moment. That's the weight of what you're doing. In them, verse 23, I in them, Jesus in you, Jesus in me. Paul said, Christ in us, the hope of glory, the hope of eternity. That's our hope, our expectation of coming good. I in them, Jesus in you, and you in me, but he's talking to Father God, that they may be made perfect, and the word means mature, not that you're going to become holy and sinless, but that you're going to mature in the body of Christ, and that the world may know that you have sent me, that Father God has sent Jesus, and have loved them, get this, as you have loved me. Father God loves you, that verse says, to the same depth that he does Jesus. Now, that, that's a mind blower to me. I, I don't know what to do with that amazing statement. Jesus wanted us to know that's the way Father God feels about you, the same way he feels about Jesus. Well, pastor, my life's a mess. He wouldn't want anything to do with me. Yes, he does. He knows you. He loves you the way you are. Well, I'm not good enough. You'll never be good enough this side of heaven. It doesn't happen. I've been working on Pastor. I'm going to get this. Come back and tell me how it goes. Paul said, Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, of which I am the chief. If Paul the apostle, when he was alive, was the chief sinner, then I get that title now. Oh, pastor, listen, by the grace of God, I'm here. By God's favor, not because I deserve it, you deserve it, any of us. We're all here because God looked down on us and said, I love him. I designed him in the womb. He's made a mess of his life, which qualifies him to be a pastor. lady came up last Sunday, and she's married to an old friend of mine, but he graciously did not tell her about me, and they're going through a divorce, and so she had a date with another guy here in town who was a real good friend of mine in high school and college, and she said, you know, I talked to so-and-so the other day. <laughs> what? You did? And she said, yeah. And the cat's out of the bag. 
I said, yeah, everything he said was true, and he doesn't know the half of it. But God looked down me, looked down and said, if I save that guy and make him teach in the city he grew up in, won't that be fun? (laughs) Fun for you, not so much for me. But I say that to you so that it affects people who come here to church, not because I'm such a great teacher or because whatever. They come here because they go, that guy's a pastor? Holy moly. And some people say that about you, who know you when you were younger. And thank God, God uses flawed vessels to hold him. We are jars of clay. And each one of us has our own set of issues. And God uses those issues to encourage other people to come to him. That's his strategy for the world. That's God's strategy in human history. That's his plan. And you and I are part of it in our flawed condition. Unity. I and them. You and me. Verse 24. Heaven. Short one verse. Father, I desire they also know you gave me. Also whom you gave me may be with, with me. I can't talk. Let me try that again. Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am. He's talking about heaven that they may behold my glory, my weight, display of who I am, my majesty, which you have given me, Jesus said, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. This is a, a thought bigger than I know how to explain. I last this week when I was reading former Prime Minister, British Prime Minister Lloyd George writing about heaven. He said, when I was a boy, the thought of heaven used to frighten me more than the thought of hell. Because I pictured heaven as a place where time would be perpetual Sundays. When perpetual church services from which there would be no break... It was a horrible nightmare, and it made me an atheist for 10 years, (laughs) having to go to church the whole time. Thank God that's not what heaven is. Our, Our minds are too small to wrap them around eternity. Hang on. So Jesus said, from before the foundations of the world, before there was earth, before there was sun, before there was solar system, before there was outer space, before there was angels, before there was time, before that fourth dimension was even added into the creation. There were three, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's what Jesus is saying. The weight the glory, the majesty that I had with you before the world was created, before the foundation of the world. And our brain goes, I can't think that far back. We'll now try and look forward that long. And I've tried to use that. The Hebrew word for eternity is the word where if you're standing on a railroad track and you look down the track as far as you can see and the two rails come together, a little parallax in your eyes, beyond the vanishing point. That's what eternity means. As far as you, far as you can look back, as far as you can look forward, that's bigger than I can hold on to very long. Jesus longs for you and I to be with him for eternity. You love me before the foundation of the world. Love, that's the point, verse 25. Oh, righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I've known you, and these have known that you sent me. He calls him Father, Holy Father, here, righteous Father. Righteous and holy talks about God's absolute sinlessness. 
Contrast it, of course, with my and your sinfulness. The world has not known you. The blind, unbelieving world doesn't know God. And this is eternal life. We looked at last week, verse 3, 17, 3. And this is eternal life, that they may know, gnosko, they might know by experience. They might have an experiential relationship with God. That's what he's saying. The only true God in Jesus Christ who you have sent. That's what eternal life is. And I have declared to them your name. Your name? Yahweh. The great I am that I am at the burning bush. I am your redeemer. I am your savior. I am your physician. I am your hope. I am your light. I am your way in life, the pathway. I am whatever you need, he's saying. I've given them your name that they would understand that I am anything they could possibly need in life. And that the love which you loved me may be in them and I in them, Christ in you, Jesus Christ taking up residence in you. You are the vessel. You contain him when you surrender your life to him. And he changes this from the inside. And he takes our want to and he molds it into the same motives that he has for life. And we find ourselves wanting to do the right thing. It's not rules and regulations. That's the Old Testament. This is the New Testament. This is the New Covenant. As he said in Ezekiel 36 and Jeremiah 31, I'll take out your heart of stone. You know this. And I'll put in a heart of flesh. And I'll write on your heart my law of love. Love God with your whole heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And I will cause you, what? I will cause you to walk in my ways. You'll want to walk with God. When you surrender to him, he starts moving that around in you. He wants you. And you say, well which you loved me, maybe in them love. Again, another astounding statement. You remember back in John 16, 26, he said, and the Father himself loves phileo you. He has a fondness for you. He has affection for you. And you're going, ah, Pastor, you know how messed up I am. He loves you as you are right now sitting where you are. Not as you should be, because none of us will be as we should be this side of heaven. He loves you the way they are, you are. But he loves us so much that he won't leave us that way. And he does this heart surgery and this injection of the Holy Spirit into us. And he changes our motive, the thing that moves us along the road of life. Prayer. In prayer, we're approaching God closer than at any other time. And it is what God wants for us, a relationship. Okay, so let me close with this. I love uh, D.L. Moody. He was an evangelist in Civil War time, way, way back, 1800s. And he had a church in Chicago that is still there to this day. It seats 3,000 people which is what this church sits with all the spaces taken up. So it's as big as this church. And uh, in the middle of the 1860s, right after the Civil War, 1865, 66, there was an atheist in the city that was well known. He had been a colonel in the Northern Army and was a hero. But he'd seen so much war and horrible things that he uh, was an atheist, and which was a big deal. Not too many people talked like this in the 1800s. And so he would go into the farmer's market of Chicago, still there today, and he would take a soapbox, literally a wooden crate that soap came in, stand up on it, and blaspheme God every day in the marketplace. This is an angry guy. And he'd say horrible things about God. 
And the people at first, they were shocked by it. And then, you know, you get used to it. And they started ignoring him. So he upped the ante. And one day, he stood in the box and he shouted, There is no God and I can prove it to you. People stopped. He said, I'm going to ask God to kill me in the next five minutes so you'll know. He can't do it because it won't happen. Watch. And he yells, God, strike me down dead in the next five minutes. And people who were ignoring him said, well, I can wait five minutes. <laughs> they watched him, right? Go around. And finally he says, five minutes. See, I told you there is not a God. People shrugged their shoulders and walked off, except one little old lady from Moody's church. And uh, she was in her 70s, and she walked up to him, and she said, uh, excuse me, sir, very quiet. She said, do you have any children? And he said, well, yes, I do. Why? Why do you ask? And she said, because if one of your children came up to you with a knife and said, here, Daddy, take this knife and kill me, would you do it? He said, well, of course not. What a ridiculous thing to say. Astonishing. And she said, well, that's exactly why God didn't kill you a minute ago. Because he loves you too much. And it got to the man. It choked him up. And she led him to Christ and prayed for him there on that spot. Go and do the same. God bless you. Why don't you stand and we'll pray together. Lord, we thank you that you've given us truth. You've given us light. You've given us your word. And we thank you that most of us in this room have experienced what that means. To have our heart changed, have our focus in life changed, and, and our motives for doing things. We love you for that, Lord. And we ask that you keep doing it more. And, and Lord, we also pray for anyone in this room this morning or within the sound of my voice on the internet or radio that don't know you, that you would give them the grace to do that. Christians, please pray. So if you're here this morning, maybe you're visiting for the first time or you've been here before, or maybe you've been a Christian when you were younger in your life and you've fallen away from it. But you know you need God to forgive your sins. You know you're a sinner. I don't have to tell you that. We all know that. But if you'd like to know that your sins are forgiven, if you'd like to know that you're going to spend eternity with God, if you're ready to surrender your life to him, would you let me know you're ready? By looking up at me and raising your hand. I won't do anything to embarrass you. I'll just acknowledge it. God bless you, young lady. And you, sir, and the two couple behind you. Right in front of me, you, sir, bless you, lady in front of me, behind the sound booth, couple, God bless you. Anyone over here, God is speaking to you, yes, sir, God bless you, young lady, yes, God bless you in front of you. Anyone over here, back row, bless you, young man, yes, God bless you. If I miss your hand, don't worry, God did not. Those of you that raised your hands, would you please pray with the rest of us? We're just going to ask God to forgive our sins. And we'll say it with you to make it easy. Everybody please say, Lord Jesus, I surrender. I give you my life. Please forgive my sins. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Those of you that raised your hands, yeah, God bless you. We'd encourage you to go over these double doors. We don't want anything from you. We want to give you a Bible, pray for you. Uh, anybody that needs prayer, sick or whatever, please go there to the rest. God bless you. Give somebody a hug before you go home. Pastor Rick tonight, you'll love him. Dennis will be back.